Uh, my name is uh, Toshihiro Nakayama. I uh, uh, teach American politics uh, and foreign policy and US-Japan relations at uh, Keio University, uh, which is uh, <coughs> located in, in Tokyo. Uh, actually, my, my campus itself is in uh, Kanaga Prefecture, so uh, uh, right by Tokyo. Uh, and I've been doing this for, for some time. So I'd like to sort of uh, share my view about uh, where US-Japan uh, relations stand, not in a uh, historical perspective, more, uh, more uh, of a sort of contem com uh, contemporary view about uh, <clears throat> where US-Japan uh, relations and, and specifically US-Japan alliance are at. You know? So you know, there's, there's lots of things going on sort of around the world uh, in our region. Uh, you know, of course, you know, I can't talk about it all. So I'll focus on this uh, bilateral relations uh, uh, itself and then try to sort of give an overview about <clears throat> what's going on uh, in our part of the world. Okay, so I will share the slides uh, that I made just a couple of minutes ago. So there you go. The title of my <clears throat> lecture will be Japan-US relations in the age of uh, great power competition. Right. So, you know, Japan and the uh, US met for the first time in the uh, 18th century. And, you know, this is uh, the ship uh, which uh, Commodore Perry visited Japan. But since then, it's been, a, it's been quite some time. We've had some uh, difficult years during the wars, but uh, besides that, you know, US-Japan relations uh, has been uh, pretty smooth. And I would say that uh, it is uh, uh, still quite good today as well. But we seldom uh, stop and think about you know, what uh, this uh, relation is and what this relation uh, means to both of us, both of our countries and to the region as well. So let me just uh, try to sort of lay out and, and, and think about where we are at the moment in the uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, our region and more broadly uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of world politics. Uh, during the, you know, Cold War, that's the uh, pre-1990s, uh, uh, you know, US, Japan, US and Japan was a uh, important sort of alliance, alliance partner in uh, sort of contending with the uh, sort of the communist regime. Uh, uh, you know, of course, the, the main sort of Battlefront was was in Europe. But there was a cold front, uh, a cold war front in East Asia as well, and uh, Japan played an important sort of uh, uh, you know uh, part of the uh, the Western world as an alliance to the U.S. Our former prime minister sort of called you know the sort of the islands of Japan because of its uh, geographical location and, and and strategic implications. Uh, unsinkable sort of uh, aircraft carrier, right? But sort of when the Cold War ended, uh, you know, many in the U.S., uh, people in the U.S. thought, you know, sort of the, you know, the grand battle of history is over, right? Uh, you fought with, uh, you know, the, the fascism, uh, you know, Japanese sort of imperial power during uh, World War II, and after that, you fought a uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, existential competition with the communist regime. Now it's over. This grand historical narrative you know, that would define uh, uh, you know, virtually sort of everything, uh, <clears throat> including domestic affairs, you know, those uh, uh, historical battle has ended. Therefore, you know, it's, it is sort of the end of history. It doesn't mean that the sort of the time would end, but in terms of historical events, you know, uh, there wouldn't be any sort of uh, uh, existential sort of competition toward, uh, 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 you know, against an enemy or a foe. So uh, Francis Fukuyama, a Japanese American <clears throat> scholar sort of uh, coined this term, the end of history. And, you know, an implication of that was that, you know, U.S. would no longer sort of, you know, go abroad and, and, and change the world, right? So 
you know, there was questions about the alliance as well, you know, because the Soviet Union is no more. There's no uh, threat uh, that would uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of challenge U.S. existence itself. Why is there a need for a Cold War alliance? Right? So, in 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 the uh, one moment in 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 the 1990s, there was sort of a uh, a drift, uh, if you will. Uh, in terms of U.S.-Japan alliance. Right? So we, we all know that President Clinton ran in 1992 with the slogan of, it's the economy, stupid. Right? It's no longer national security. <clears throat> and uh, uh, sort of there was an implication that Japan as a rising economy, I mean, we were rising back in the 1990s, right? Uh, uh, that rising Japan may be, a, a foe, not an enemy, but could be a potential a sort of uh, uh, adversary, right? It was that kind of uh, atmosphere as well. So the alliance uh, went adrift uh, uh, for a while, but I think uh, there was wise people on both sides that uh, this alliance is not just you know between US and Japan and, and that it's not just to uh, sort of counter sort of, you know, Soviet aggression, which doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, throughout the period, uh, this alliance, US Japan alliance, became sort of a, a cornerstone, a foundation of a stable regional order uh, in, you know, our part of the region, Asia Pacific. Right? So both sides came together and, and made it it sort of transformed the alliance that it would make sense right? even uh, after the uh, Cold War threat is gone, more uh, as a tool uh, for sort of regional stability and public good. So uh, I would say that the uh, US-Japan alliance is not a typical alliance in that sense. You know, it, it is welcomed by the regional players uh, regional countries and uh, successfully transformed itself into uh, a, a sort of a public good, I would say. That was sort of the latter half of the uh, 1990s. And of course, you know, the 2000s was a totally uh, a different kind of decade because of, uh, uh, you know, 9-11 uh, in 2001. Uh, US sort of to totally redefined its role in world affairs and focused uh, sort of almost solely on global war on terror, right? GWAT, that's sort of the, the Pentagon jargon that people like to use. And uh, you know, during that time, uh, not that US sort of to totally dismissed what was going on in the Asia Pacific uh, to uh, President uh, George W. Bush's credit, he did, uh, and his team did play uh, attention to Asia. But, you know, uh, it was inevitable, inevitable that uh, sort of the uh, prime focus would be sort of the greater Middle East, right? Uh, sort of you know, North Africa, the Middle East, and then sort of South Asia and Central Asia, right? That was where the battlefront was. So during that time, uh, you know, I wouldn't criticize uh, U.S. for sort of uh, bypassing uh, 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 you know, a region, but again, uh, the focus was on the Middle East. And then the 2010s came and uh, it was a uh, you know, at least the latter, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the earlier part of the uh, 2010s was uh, President Obama's uh, era. And his foreign policy was about reset, right? Uh, there, were, there were several reset, I would assume, uh, you, know, you know, not relying too much on hard power, and focusing you know, the sort of uh, uh, utilize soft power more. Uh, uh, you know, sort of President Bush was more focused on unilateralism, you know, acting alone, whereas uh, Obama treated acting together with partners uh, using international institutions. Uh, uh, makes sense. So that was another kind of reset. And, of, and also there was uh, a reset uh, in terms of you know, domestic priorities and sort of the global sort of obligations, right? President uh, Obama wanted to sort of do more in terms of domestic affairs, you know, Obamacare is, I guess, the prime, uh, prime example, right? 
But you know, for our region, the most important reset was the geographical reset. They called it uh, sometimes pivot, and because you know pivot means you sort of turn around and sort of forget forget about other regions. People in, in the Middle East and Europe didn't like it, so they uh, renamed uh, pivot as the rebalance. Right? It's it's the change in balance. Not that we're gonna get you know get out from the Middle East or Europe. Right, so it was kind of the uh, getting ready period, right? But as we uh, sort of enter the latter half of the 2010s and uh, uh, when the Trump team came in, uh, you know, by the way, uh, in Japan, uh, Mr. Trump's reputation is uh, mixed, but it's not as harsh as the one you hear quite often from Europe. Right. Not that uh, Mr. Trump was our favorite uh, president or anything like that. It was more that, uh, uh, you know, if you uh, sort of look at President Obama's uh, China policy, sometimes it was uh, very confusing. Uh, some critics would say it was, you know, wish-washy. Uh, uh, you wanted to become friends at the same time, but you wanted to sort of compete, maybe confront. So it was a very mixed message. And in terms of you know, America's priority in uh, Asia, it was like a laundry list. You know, they listed all the things that they had to do, but we didn't actually sort of see the priorities you know, sort of among those lists. So it was a sophisticated, you know, uh, uh, well-designed policy in a way, right, Obama's Asia policy. But because it was too sophisticated, it, it sort of ended up in a mixed message. And, uh, you know, on the receiver's end, it was very confusing, right? Compared to that, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, China policy wasn't, it was far from sophisticated. But the one thing we were sure was that it looked tough. I, we, we don't know whether it was a smart policy what, or whether it was really tough, right? But uh, the, the message was clearly sent that, you know, we're entering the era of great power competition. Right? It's, 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 it's no longer about uh, war on terrorism or sort of, you know, uh, perpetual wars in Afghanistan or Iraq. It was... China. Right? So therefore, you know, not that Japanese uh, people appreciated uh, Mr. Trump, but at least on this uh, uh, issue, he looked uh, uh, coherent. I mean, that's almost an you know, oxymoron or maybe the, the term coherent and Mr. Trump doesn't quite fit together. But in terms of China, it, it sort of did, right? not totally. And so that's sort of where we are at, right? We, we have entered the uh, uh, era of uh, uh, sort of major power, great power uh, uh, sort of competition, right? So in that sort of kind of realm, what are the challenges uh, that Japan is facing? You know, uh, of course, and we have uh, issue of uh, domestic uh, stagnation. Uh, we have uh, been in a stalemate, uh, sort of, uh, since the uh, mid 1990s, right, after the burst of the economy. Not that uh, you know uh, we're, we're struggling uh, daily, but we have lost uh, sort of the vibrant sort of uh, energy, and uh, uh, and also what's sort of accelerating that is the decrease in our population, which some say is a existential threat to Japan. Right? So as as uh, as do uh, many other countries, we are facing our own domestic uh, stagnation challenges. Right? And of course, as a member of a global community, uh, uh, we're uh, we're facing uh, global challenges as well. Uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, global warming is one, but but there are many others, right? Many issues uh, that we have to deal with are can't uh, be dealt with a sort of a single sort of governments or several governments efforts, but it has to be coordinated globally. And uh, Japan, although you know, uh, we 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 are not known 
for you know taking you know a very sort of uh, dramatic positions uh i think we've been a constructive partner largely in uh, uh many of the global challenges that we're facing and just to add to that uh japan fortunately is not facing the challenge of uh sort of you know reactionary populism which you see in uh, other western democracies uh, i think that's quite fortunate but the other side is that because we're uh, you know a very sort of you know uh, a monotonous uh, society right uh, you know Although, you know, we see many uh, uh, people from other countries uh, living and, and working in Japan, but compared to others, you know, <clears throat> uh, we don't have this, uh, uh, this uh, you know, negative feeling about strangers because the number is limited. Therefore, sort of, I guess, limiting uh, sort of the rise of a reactionary uh, sort of populist sentiment, which is so often... Uh, directed against you know, foreign workers and, and immigrants, right? Which you see in the US and uh, Europe, Germany, France, uh, and UK, which resulted in, in, in Brexit to a certain degree. <clears throat> uh, those, those don't exist. So taking uh, an affirmative position uh, in these uh, global challenges, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's that much of a, a, you know, a political constraint here in Japan. Right. And, and also, uh, uh, we, you know, we sort of got used to it, but it's still a serious a challenge uh, and a threat, which is the, uh, uh, you know, the actions taken by North Korea, right, Demo Democratic People's Republic of Korea, that's uh, still a significant threat. But among these uh, challenges, I think the largest challenge is <clears throat> uh, China's rise. And it's it's not that we're against China's rise per se. I mean, nations rise, nations fall. Uh, you know, we can manage uh, a, a nation's rise if it's peaceful. Uh, you know, Japan rose, I think, uh, without uh, like uh, significantly competing and 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 sort of uh, you know, diving into a adversarial uh, uh, relations uh, uh, with well. In the 1920 and 30s, we did, but I was, I was talking about the post war period, right? <clears throat> Japan's rise in itself, I think, didn't threat anybody. Uh, but what we worry about China's rise is that we don't know where it's going. You see what's going on domestically about uh, Chinese leadership. It seems like uh, President Xi uh, uh, is willing to stay in power uh, uh, for some time. Uh, 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 beyond the usual tra tradition that uh, Chinese leaders have enjoyed uh, the leadership. Uh, you see some human rights uh, abuses, challenges in uh, Xinjiang and other parts of the world. Uh, uh, what's going on in Hong Kong, uh, what's uh, happening uh, uh, in the Taiwan Straits and the pressure it uh, 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 sort of the pressure tactic uh, against uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, uh, you see its actions in South uh, China Sea and also East uh, China Sea as well. And uh, if you, uh, and, and there are many others, right? China is no longer a, a, a pure a regional power. I wouldn't say it's a global power yet, but it has a global scope, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're in the sort of the Southern Pacific, they're in the Middle East, they're in Latin America, uh, the Caribbean uh, uh, sort of states uh, in Latin America as well, right? And if you add up, uh, uh, and also in sort of uh, cyberspace and outer space too, right? we, we see their aggressive uh, behavior. And if you sort of, uh, sort of combine, uh, add up all those uh, uh, actions, uh, we fear uh, and we see a, uh, a hegemonic ambition uh, of China uh, and a sort of a China-centric order that they're trying to sort of, uh, sort of establish and build up. It's not going to happen in like two, three, five, ten years. I think they're playing a long game. Right? Uh, but we uh, 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 sort of fear that uh, a China-centric order and a, uh, a China uh, becoming a hegemonic power in that kind of order is not good uh, uh, for Japan, of course, uh, but for the region and uh, uh, you know, for the world as well.
because uh, Asia Pacific, uh, this East Asia is a very dynamic, uh, vibrant region. And if you see China as a hegemon, maybe, you know, in terms of trade and economic, uh, will we'll still be uh, a, 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 a meaningful, viable region. Uh, but in terms of democracy, uh, in terms of human, human rights, uh, in terms of rule-based order, I think uh, we're going to recede into something very different. And I think we fear that. And, and Japan, among <clears throat> our friends uh, in the region, is one of the few countries who is explicitly rejecting uh, that kind of order to take hold uh, in this region. There are some, some, you know, some others, right? Like uh, Australia, India, Vietnam in its own way is uh, resisting uh, uh, that kind of order. Uh, but the thing is, you know, we can't do this alone right? because uh, China's rise is a historic rise. You know, back, back in the 50s and 60s, people did talk about Japan sort of re-rise as you know miracle in 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 the East uh, East Asia, and it was. But in terms of size and speed and magnitude, I think uh, China's rise uh, far exceeds that of Japan. Right? Uh, and uh, there are sort of worrying trends that we see. Uh, but I think there's a strong determination that we're not going to just you know, bow down and, and, and step back. Right? So what are the options that we have? Right? So these are the options that I've listed. Uh, some you know, uh, not too realistic. Uh, some may be a little more uh, realistic than others. Right? But I just, you know, as an sort of an intellectual uh, 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 or, or sort of brainstorm, right? I've just laid out some uh, uh, options for Japan. What, what, what options do we have? Right? So and in, in terms of trying to sort of manage, deal with uh, uh, China's uh, 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 rise, which is pretty un unpredictable and which uh, worries us a lot, right? So one uh, option is that Japan uh, return to this notion of pacifism, which is laid out in the uh, uh, you know the famous pacifist, pacifist uh, constitution, which some people say and which was uh, uh, drafted uh, partly by uh, the U.S. occupying forces right back in, uh, in the 1940s. So this was rejecting war and rejecting uh, uh, the use of uh, military power and all that. And it is still in our constitution, right? Uh, it, it's, it's called Article 9. It's a, it's a controversial sort of article. Some people think that we should change it. And some think, uh, you know, some progressive and, and, and liberals prefer to sort of maintain it. Uh, it's a, a very uh, a controversial issue, but more and more there's awareness that we have to sort of change it so that it would sort of, you know, not, not that Japan can become, you know, fully express, you know, a sort of, you know, nationalism and all of that, but more to sort of adapt to the situation that we're facing, right? Um, but yes, I, I, pacifism. Why, why don't we return to this, uh, the original notion of pacifism? And then maybe China, China would stop its uh, aggressive behavior in uh, East China Sea and sort of uh, uh, issues related to us, right? Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, uh, that uh, notion, sort of returning to pacifism, does not sort of uh, match the situation that, that we're facing. And I don't think there's a strong support for that kind of pacifism either uh, in Japan, uh, uh, no longer, right? Uh, pacifism uh, was sort of like a, you know, Japan is a, a religious uh, nation. Uh, I, I think we have own uh, a faith uh, uh, or beliefs, but it's not like a, a sort of strictly defined religion. Uh, it's, it's more sort of, uh, sort of blended it into a tradition. So maybe in, in the West, you won't call that a religion, but uh, it's, it's some sort of faith sort of beyond here and now. And I think that does exist. 
But in terms of, you know, religion uh, in a in a sort of traditional sense, uh, I think Japan is uh, is a a religious uh, society. So uh, I, I often used to say that uh, pacifism was the closest thing that 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 Japan had, the post-war Japan had uh, to a religion. So it was sort of like a civic religion. It was a very strong sentiment. But now, you know, the situation has changed in that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people sort of are more aware of what's going on. That, you know, pacifism in terms of just sort of not, defending yourself you know not taking up arms uh, is uh, irresponsible right? japan is not just a small nation like i said you know prime minister nakasone called it a, an unsinkable aircraft carrier right? so i mean if you're located in an important geographical sort of uh, location it's your responsibility to be able to sort of uh, not create a vacuum and defend yourself so i think there's a widespread understanding in japan about that today right? So what about the second option, which is the totally opposite from you know, pacifism, is to go full spec, right? Become a military power. Uh, I think you know how sort of uh, 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 hesitant we are about uh, uh, nuclear weapons because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But I guess you know autonomous national defense may include you know Japan going nuclear, right? Acquiring a nuclear sub, uh, strategic aircraft carriers, uh, conscription, double, triple our sort of defense budget, which is uh, extremely low compared to others in terms of G a percentage to the GDP. Right? Uh, uh, you know that that kind of option, right? Full spec, military power. But unfortunately, uh, that's not a realistic option as well. And of course, you know, nuclear weapons issue has its own sort of uh, sensitivities. Uh, and, and most of all, I think uh, the Japanese people would not sort of buy that, would agree with that. And more, maybe more importantly, you know, where's the money right, kind of discussion. So, and, you know, uh, if you look at our neighbors, uh, 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 we always have difficult sort of relations with our immediate neighbors, like uh, Korea, South Korea and China, because of the historical issues. Right? Uh, but if you sort of go beyond these immediate neighbors in Southeast Asia, in you know, Australia, uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, and all that, uh, Taiwan, they're all welcoming Japan taking affirmative position on sort of these security matters, right? It's, it's being welcomed. But if you go far as becoming a full spec, you know, a, a military power, I think uh, uh, people would hesitate. Uh, but most of all, like I said, you know, there wouldn't be support in, in Japan. So it's not politically realistic, right? So pacifism is out, you know, autonomous national defense is not an option as well. Then uh, what about like regional organizations, right? Some people say that, you know, in here in our region, there's, it's, it's, it's like an alphabet soup. We, we live within an alphabet soup because there's so many regional organizations uh, like we don't remember. There's APEC, there's ARF, there's EAS, uh, you know, there's some, you know, free trade agreement like TPP, RCEP, uh, and all that, right? Uh, so what about, uh, sort of relying on regional organization as other regions do, right? Because other regions have, you know, quite effective regional organization. It may not be able to sort of solve a really sort of uh, uh, like uh, hard sort of national interest sort of clashing uh, uh, issues, but you can coordinate, you can sort of engage in a sort of a, 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 a peace building sort of, uh, uh, you know, effort, confidence building measures, measures and all that. What about relying on regional organizations? Right? Basically, you know, most of the regional organizations here are, some critics say, talk shops, right? Not that it's totally unuseful, it's, it's nice to talk, right? But, uh, it doesn't have the mandate and the power to deal with the most sensitive issues. You know, China's always in, in, in most of these uh, uh, arrangements. It's a consensus-based uh, uh, sort of, you know, decision-making process. Therefore, you can't make uh, uh, important decisions on hardly contested issues. It's nice, again, you know, I, I'm not saying that it's totally unuseful, but it's, uh, 
it's a, a, a difficult tool in terms of solving uh, difficult issues, right? Uh, then, uh, of course, you know, there's the ultimate uh, uh, global organization, which you know, New York, you host, uh, which is uh, the United Nations. But as we all know, uh, how, uh, yes, UN is effective in, in some areas like, like development and, and children's education, so humanitarian efforts, uh, World Food Program and all that. But in terms of these uh, national security and national interest related matters, you know, the, uh, the Security Council, United Nations Security Council is uh, 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 where those matters would be handled. But we all know uh, the, uh, the P5, right? Uh, the permanent uh, members uh, have a say in the kind of agenda that they would take up. And, and most of all, if they don't agree with it, how they can just veto it. So who's representing uh, Asia in P5? It's, it's only one country. Right? Asia is a huge diverse region. But only one country represents China. It's a non-democracy and it's China. Right? So there's always talk about UN reform, but you know, it's been going on since the uh, 90s, but uh, we don't see much progress in that. We've been raising our hands right, constantly. And by the way, U.S. supports Japan becoming a member of the uh, uh, Security Council as a, a permanent, but others don't, right? for obvious reasons. Right? So global organization for us doesn't quite work. Right? So what about uh, sort of treaty alliance other than with the U.S.? By the way, the only uh, treaty, tre treaty alliance relations with, uh, we have, uh, uh, Japan has, is with the United States, right? U.S. has uh, many treaty obligations, but for Japan, U.S. Uh, Japan-U.S. alliance is the only treaty alliance that we have. So why not think about you know, other options, uh, other allies, right? Uh, in a way, we're doing that, uh, you know, our... Uh, uh, you know, bilateral sort of security cooperation with Australia is increasing. You know, Australia is being uh, uh, more and more aware of the aggressive uh, behavior of uh, 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 you know China. So I think we uh, we were quite surprised, uh, and I think you've you've all heard about this uh, this uh, so, somewhat. Uh, awkward sounding uh, sort of you know, security arrangement called AUKUS, right? Australia, UK, US, and UK and US providing uh, uh, a nuclear subs uh, to Australia, which is a long time commitment. They're on only going to acquire the nuclear subs in uh, the late 2030s. Right? And once you install a nuclear sub, you know, it will go on for like 30 years. So this acquiring a nuclear sub is a half a century commitment, right? Which is sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 you know, uh, sort of came out from this notion that competition with China would be a long game. Right? I was joking with my friends in uh, Australia that uh, one was saying that this is like a, a shopping a new shopping arrangement, right? To acquire a nuclear subs. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think it was just a shopping arrangement. Well, if it, if it is a shopping arrangement, it's like, uh, you know, the, the Eagles Hotel California, right? You can check in at any time, but you can never leave. It's that kind of long commitment, right? So Australia more or less uh, share uh, 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 the views uh, that, that we have about China. So uh, we're, beefing up, uh, uh, we are increasing uh, a defense cooperation with Australia. And to a certain degree with India as well, uh, with Vietnam, uh, and even uh, you know, countries like UK, which is trying to become a relevant power in uh, the Indo-Pacific, which is the, the term that we use uh, to sort of you know, uh, uh, call our region because there's a connectedness between the Pacific Ocean and the, in the ocean, right? France is also sort of having interest in, in this region. France is a Indo-Pacific power, right? They have an, they have an island uh, 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 and some, uh, uh, you know, not a few people living there, right? So they, they become much more interest in this region. You know, Atlantic Ocean, is no longer a main stage of world history. 
I think the perception has shifted that Indo-Pacific has become uh, the main stage. So yes, we've been uh, uh, increasing defense cooperation uh, uh, with uh, you know other democracies, which is which is good. I think it's 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 a route that we should pursue. But uh, can we expect uh, you know an Indian Navy to come and support? You know, what uh, some contingency that we would face uh, uh, surrounding Japan, right? Uh, I don't think it's realistic to expect that. Could, could we expect uh, UK playing a role uh, in terms of uh, aggression uh, by Chinese forces? Uh, that is also uh, a very sort of difficult to imagine. Although, you know, uh, in terms of sort of, you know, moral boost and sort of try to show sort of the resiliency of democracies, you know, you know, many partners we have the better, right? that's no doubt. And, and we're, we're, we're doing that. But in terms of, you know, realistically sort of coping with the, the situation uh, uh, that we may face, right? It's, it's, it's not that, uh, that that it's going to happen, but but uh, you know some unexpected contingency uh, 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 might arise, and we might have to tackle with that. Uh, and the best option that we have at the moment, and for some time to come, is I think, and, and many of the people in Japan think, is the Japan-U.S. alliance. Right. So, I mean these options right from pacifism to uh, uh treaty alliance other than with the us uh, uh you know pacifism you know autonomous national defense uh, totally un unrealistic maybe you can call it a fantasy uh regional organization global organization we should sort of aim at try to sort of you know uh, uh increase its uh uh, uh you know a capability treaty alliance with the us so welcome but to deal with the core issues. It's the Japan-US alliance. So some people say that Japan is a country without plan B. You know, there's only US-Japan alliance left. Right? Uh, but the thing is, you know, if you like, I did compare all the uh, you know, all, uh, other options, but the thing is uh, among all the options that we have or we may have, I think it is the best option that we have. So I think we're fortunate in that sense. Some people, some people in Japan, uh, criticize the fact that you know Japan uh, is a country without Plan B. Right? That's uh, it's it's not a good uh, uh, condition for a nation state to be in. Right? That may be true, but but then again, uh, it the alliance with the U.S. makes sense. And among all the options, you know, it, it is the most realistic and most effective uh, uh, sort of option. So in that sense, I think we're, we're for, uh, fortunate, right? But the question is, is, uh, you know, uh, alliance is not like, you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one sort of uh, partner benefits all and one doesn't, right? It has to be sort of two parties. Uh, in order that to be sustainable, two parties have to benefit. Uh, or else it, it won't be sort of uh, sustainable. So the question is, uh, is this uh, uh, th an arrangement that only benefits Japan? Right? I don't think so, right? Uh, if you, you the, the message that, that you quite often hear from the US uh, uh, these days is that US is no longer uh, a hegemony that it's it's more focused on pulling back as you saw in Afghanistan and President Biden uh, seems to uh, be uh, determined to leave Iraq as well, right? So there's this uh, theory of foreign policy of restraint, right? That we're not gonna do more, right? We're going to pull back. We're going to end these forever wars, right? So, and I'm not saying, you know, President Trump and President Biden are the same. I, in personal characters and their sort of uh, outlook vision of the uh, of the country they're totally totally different but you know that doesn't mean that they're totally different right uh, there are some similarities uh, there's a you know america first and middle class foreign policy which is a organizing concept of biden foreign policy 
as a continuum there, right? It's about restraint, not doing more, except for China. That's that's the uh, the same uh, part as well. They're, they're both tough on China, but on other parts, you know, we're basically going to pull back. That's was the message of America first. President Trump did it in a very blunt way. Right? Uh, President Biden may be doing that in a, a bit more sophisticated way, but if you see how U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan without informing U.K., uh, sort of uh, establishing arrangement of AUKUS without notifying France, which, which had a submarine contract with Australia before the you know, U.S. had. You know, it's it, it sometimes see unilateral, and we, we know that French foreign minister said, you know, that this is as unilateral as Mr. Trump. Uh, that, was, that was the criticism. So we see foreign policy of restraint. So is U.S. really sticking? to the commitments of U.S. Japan alliance. Are they trying to sort of pull back? I would make the argument, and uh, at least I think this is shared widely among the national security experts in the U.S., and, and especially people who is focused on East Asia is well, well aware of this. But uh, uh, to you know, a, a general audience uh, for students, it, uh, who's interested in international relations. I, I don't think uh, uh, you almost never think about the role of US-Japan alliance and whether it benefits the US or not, right? But actually I think it does. And I, I've sort of laid out six points, you know, uh, there, there may be some more, right? The first is that US benefits from, uh, from being a resident power in Asia. Right. Yes. Uh, well, U.S. is an Asia Pacific power. Right. So, if you sort of expand this geographical notion to Indo Pacific, right, you are a part of uh, uh, Indo Pacific. But of course, there's a, you know, a wide uh, or, or huge pond you know, uh, called uh, Pacific Ocean uh, between us. Uh, and, and, you know, although we're living in, in the age of cyber and all in space and all that, geography still matters, right? It takes time to get to one place to another, right? So geography matters. Uh, but sort of another way of looking at it is that, you know, since the, uh, like, maybe the mid or at least the end of the 19th century, U.S. has been a functional part of Asia. You've been an economic power, a military power, and political power as well. So U.S. is a resident power in Asia, and you benefit from it, and especially uh, in a period uh, where Asia is the economic engine and sort of the, you know, the, the, pra the place where you have a vibrant energy, right? So U.S. can benefit largely by uh, remaining a resident power in Asia. And if you if U.S. wants to sort of remain a resident uh, uh, power in Asia, it's nice to have a reliable partner, right? You have many partners. Uh, you have many sort of treaty obligations as well. You know, uh, besides Japan, you have U.S. ROK alliance relations with the Philippines, Singapore. Uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, although not an ally, you know, your relations are becoming closer, despite the change in uh, a difference in regime uh, and, and political ideology. You have you know, political commitments to Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand is your uh, important partner. And in, 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 in case of Australia, it's becoming more and more important ally. Yes, so you have many partners, right? But in terms of you know, uh, uh, basis, that uh, uh, Japan hosts, uh, you know, in terms of sense of shared values, right? Uh, uh, democracy, uh, human rights, and all that. You know, the fact that Japan is a mature democracy, uh, we've been a stable democracy uh, uh, for quite some time. Many of the uh, democracy in, in this region is uh, relatively new, but. Uh, uh, we think we have succeed. No, I'm not saying that we don't have any issues or anything. I, uh, I mean, we do. Uh, we do have many uh, issues that we have to tackle. But there's a understanding 
that, uh, or at least an aspiration, a strong aspiration to become and to 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 keep on sort of maintaining the sense of mature uh, uh, democracy. That's important as well. Uh, of course, uh, Japan, although it wasn't as it's not as uh, uh, a dominant as before, you know, uh, uh, our sort of uh, technological might uh, still is relevant. Uh, more and more, you know, we talk about diversifying, you know, supply and change so that we don't have to rely on China too much, right? So Japan and U.S. can, with other countries, you know, together with other countries, we can sort of uh, establish a a resilient uh, supply chain, uh, a sort of among the uh, uh, democracies, right? So that we have, we don't have to rely too much on China. And there's a, uh, a, a very strong sort of favorable sentiment towards the uh, U.S. Like I said, there's, you know, U U.S. Uh, bases in Japan is uh, quite significant in size and capability, right? It's, it's by far uh, the most, uh, uh, the biggest and uh, the most effective one in, uh, uh, in our parts of the region, right? in, 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 in East Asia. And uh, there are some, you know, frictions uh, with the local communities, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not like an anti-US based get out political movement, right? It's, it's, it's an issue that you have to manage constantly because then, you know, the issue would be arising, like the noise, and like the crimes that some of the soldiers commit. So it's, a, it's basically a, I think, a management issue. And uh, if you look at whole Japan, I think there's a strong consensus that U.S. Uh, uh, bases uh, are an important part of you know, Japan's uh, uh, sort of national security policy. Right? And uh, lastly, but the, not the least, I think U.S. and Japan share the same sort of uh, uh, vision about the desirable, uh, desirable sort of uh, uh, kind of regional order that should be upheld in this region. Right? It's an open and rule-based regional order where everybody can sort of join in and compete, right? Competition doesn't have to be like, you know, a clash of nations, right? There's a hard competition and a soft competition. And, uh, you know, competition is good, but it has to sort of, you know, based on rules and it has, it has to be open. Right. So we want that kind of order, order. and that was what made uh, the rise of Asia, and in fact, rise of China possible. Right, and China uh, is trying to sort of supplant this kind of order with another kind of order. So you know, these are, are the reasons that I think make sense. Right now, returning to uh, foreign policy for the middle class, which is like an organizing uh, a concept for the Biden administration. Uh, it is really keen on pulling back, uh, letting go responsibilities, ending forever or perpetual or, or, or never ending wars, right? Is US ready to be committed to this region? That's the kind of worry that we have uh, to a certain degree. But then again, uh, I'm uh, 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 sort of optimistic in one respect because uh, just compare it with what's going on in the Middle East, right? Middle East is a region where you have to solve issues, right? Whereas, you know, Indo-Pacific, there are many difficult issues, but there are possibility as well, right? It's a, it's, it's a dynamic region. So there are uh, sort of dealing with uh, Indo-Pacific is about dealing with positives as well. But the Middle East, it's, it's not really. These issues keep on rising. And uh, you sort of constantly have to sort of uh, tackle those issues, right? It's, it's about dealing with negative issues. Uh, look at the allies in uh, the Middle East, uh, you know, or what well, you have uh, Israel, but you also have countries like Saudi Arabia. Right? Can you be proud of Saudi Arabia as an ally? Are they like an open democracy? You know, they're not, right? But if you look at your partners in Asia Pacific, well, maybe you can't be proud of it, but but I guess you could if you compare it with uh, you know other regions, right? Uh, Australia, Japan, ROK, you know, they're all sort of vibrant democracies. 
So you don't have to worry or explain about who you are sort of partnering up with in, in oration. And uh, uh, also in the Middle East, basically people in the Middle East want US out, right? That was the source of, you know, Al Qaeda's political message or political ideology as well, right? We want US out, right? no occupying forces. But here in uh, East Asia, we want US to stay. Right? We, we want US to be a resident power uh, uh, in this region. And for Japan, we're willing to, to host the US because we have transformed it to a public good function. Uh, so, so foreign policy for the middle class is a foreign policy which makes sense to the American middle class, right? So in this scheme, staying in Middle East does not make sense. You have to get out, right? But when you're trying to convince staying in uh, East Asia in the framework of foreign policy for the middle class, it actually does, right? you benefit from being there. And I forgot to say this, the most important part is that, you know, in East Asia or in the Indo-Pacific, it's not about US doing alone, right? It's sort of partnering up with, you know, like-minded partners, like-minded allies and doing things together, right? I think doing things together is at the core of Biden, Mr. Biden's foreign policy. And country like Japan is willing to do more. So when we first heard of this uh, uh, concept foreign for the middle class, we were a bit nervous because it sounded like US is pulling back. But actually, if you sort of compare it uh, with the Middle East and sort of apply it, the difference is quite clear, right? Staying in Asia makes sense for the middle class. So, you know, it seems everything is okay, but of course there are challenges. Uh, the, the first challenge is uh, a challenge uh, uh, for Japan is, you know, Japan must accept more responsibilities, I guess. Right? Uh, because we were, we sort of internalized this notion of pacifism. Uh, Japanese public is very uh, uh, nervous about uh, taking up responsibility in uh, these uh, national security matters, right? But like I said just now, U.S. is demanding our part, you know, uh, American partners and uh, sort of uh, allies to do more, precisely to convince the American public, right, that this is not a responsibility America is accepting alone. We would ask countries like Japan right, to do more. And in some cases, you know, they will try to handle matters alone if they can. And they will be the initial responder. I think that would be the US uh, expectation. And in order to uh, make US Japan, US Japan Alliance you know, sustainable, I think Japan sort of has to reach that level and become more furtive, not because of the US pressure, but because it's for us, right? Because it's, it's, it is about our national security. And, you know, fortunately those two, in most cases, not always, you know, in most cases it would resonate, right? So Japan uh, must accept more responsibility in sort of uh, national security matters. Uh, and the second point, this is also a very difficult issue, I think. But, you know, although, you know, American sort of foreign policy and national security establishment, people in Washington are willing to maintain sort of America's, you know, active role in global affairs, there's a atmosphere, a, a sentiment in the U.S. that why do we have to do this? Right? Let's focus more on domestic affairs. Uh, uh, but, you know, in order for America to play a constructive role in upholding sort of democracies, America has to somehow maintain, revive 
not the American internationalism of the, uh, the latter half of the 20th, uh, 20th century, but a new kind of American internationalism in the age of global uh, 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 major power sort of uh, competition, right? If US sort of backs down, retreats, it's bad for democracy. So maintaining and reviving American inter internationalism is I think as important. And also, I think it's maybe this, the same kind of issue, this, uh, the third uh, 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 factor, is empowering democracy within and abroad as well. Because uh, you know, globally, we're seeing a retreat of democracies and the rise of the influ influence of sort of the authoritarian regimes like, like China and Russia. And not that we're asking US to sort of push back that you know, uh, aggression alone. We would be with you. Right? But America has to be there as well. And in order for America to be there, you have to sort of revive and empower your own democracy. Uh, that's not for us to say, right? but uh, looking at what, uh, what happened in the uh, uh, latter half of the, uh, uh, you know, the 2010s, right? uh, it was, was sometimes uh, 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 a very uh, 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 you know, disturbing. Right? So uh, empowering of American democracy within and, uh, and as only in a, as an extension of that abroad uh, is uh, quite important as well. And also, uh, uh, and lastly, uh, this is important as well, the, the new phase that we're entering, right? uh, the age of great power competition. This is not going to end in probably end in uh, 2020 or 2030. Right? It's going to be a long game. Uh, and maybe that might even be better than a sort of physical clash between these two, two great powers, right? So it's going to be a long competition, a long, tough co competition. So we have to be resilient. Uh, we have to be determined. Uh, but then again, I come back to the same point. We can't do this alone. U.S. can't do this alone. So it's important for, for both of us and many others to retain and cherish these uh, uh, important relations that we have in order to sort of push back these uh, neg negative elements that we're seeing in international relations. So this is in a quick manner how I see the uh, US-Japan relations, you know, slash US-Japan uh, alliance. Uh, I haven't touched uh, many important points, uh, uh, but I hope uh, I can, uh, I'll be looking forward to the uh, questions uh, and answers session in, uh, I guess, late uh, uh, October, I guess, uh, at the end of this month. So uh, this is it for today. I've used my uh, 60 minute almost fully. Uh, thank you for listening and look forward to the, uh, the discussion session. Thank you and goodbye.